they took this, you'll see it with LPL stuff, they took it to a whole nother level of amazingness with this top-down camera. Um, super legit, I'm excited about it. So, oh, they didn't mention CompuKid Mike made the DEF CON badge too, right? Like, Utah, we bat way above our weight in the InfoSec community. So we're saying like, hey, this is the cool badge at SaintCon. That's the same badge maker makes a DEF CON badge. Just saying. All right, so this is me. I'm James Pope. Everybody just calls me Pope, which was nice and easy because I had a weird last name. No matter what hacker handle I tried, it just ended up with that. Um, it did get a little more complicated because I got some brothers here with the same last name. They got to have their own handle, so I'm just still Pope. I've been doing Saint Con committee since 2015 in the AV. Did it with Kevin Howard, and uh, I sit in the Black Hat Knock as a team lead. So you'll find me there. I actually have a flying out to Europe in two weeks to do the uh, Europe show. I uh, help start and run with a lot of really good folks at DC435, which is up in Cache Valley. Also came from Salt Lake, so DC801, I'm never I'm giving up ownership of that, so I participate in that. And then I help Bryce Coons run B-Side Salt Lake as well, uh, here in Salt Lake, or that way in Salt Lake. All right, so when I was putting together this talk, I went back and looked at all the past talks I've done. And just from morbid curiosity, I was like, what's the first talk I ever did on InfoSec? And this is an actual slide deck from it. It was a security awareness training talk. I've taken out the org name that I worked for. But it was in movie theaters. That'll be prevalent as we uh, start to go. Um, and I started like looking at all the content that was in this slide deck. And it was things like phishing and spear phishing, things like patch management and social engineering. And what I realized was all the things that are in that deck is the exact same things today, right? Like I could almost get up, not that, I mean, we're all in security and you don't want to sit through security awareness training and, you know, people in security because that's not super fun because you already know you're preaching to the choir. But it was, it was a, a lot the same. So I'm looking back from a decade before, and I realize we're just staring at ourselves, right? Like, this is literally the same things we're talking about a year, a decade later, like an entire decade. And uh, uh, one caveat, one caveat. This part right here, I used to front load the front of all of my presentations, almost a third of it, just talking about why security matters. This part has absolutely changed. I now have neighbors. Six-year-old neighbors, 4 year old all my neighbors are coming over telling me about, hey, Colonial Pipeline got ransomware and gas prices are going up. Or, hey, Microsoft helped me with support and I think I lost $400, <laughs> right? <laughs> Why security matters is built in now. Everybody understands it. I still have conversations with people about things like, uh, you know, do I care if somebody has my information and we get into weird privacy conversations? That still happens, but this part has absolutely changed. Besides that, we're still doing this. We're staring at ourselves from a decade later of a lot of the same stuff. And when I realized that, I actually got kind of depressed about it, right? I'm like, this is my job, this is what I'm doing, and we're still talking about the same things. And I legitimately, like, it like, it like bent my head, right? I was like wrapped around like, just really like frustrated thinking about all these scenarios of how are we still going over the same things a decade later, right? And I started writing like a talk that was like super negative, <laughs> like all the ways you could get breached, like started just spiraling in weird directions and it was all just ended up being more negative than positive, like turning into Twitter, right? Where it's like, <laughs> And, and rightfully so, security kind of is that, and it's actually the reason I love it, is there's always new things, new vulnerabilities, but it's usually, like, if you look at it from a peer defender side, it's like, here's something else you have to deal with. You gotta go patch something else. Hey, that's, you know, you thought it was just OS, now it's computer chips, you know, now it's, you know, your BIOS and all, you know, all these other things. New bypass today of Microsoft Surface, you know, just security, right? Like, just new things over and over and over. And so, yeah, I was building out this thing that wasn't, like, the most ideal. It was just more, negative than positive, and that's not something that I wanted to do. So I thought, like, what, what is a time in my life that correlated to this? Like, I've had situations like this before where I started getting really negative about things, and, you know, how did I break out of those? So to tell this whole story, i got to start from the beginning. And the beginning is, at one point in my life, I started this company, and we did camera security, right? Like, we're installing camera systems 
all over, Chicago to Canada to whatever. We were just being shipped around, uh, putting in cameras. This is a legit picture. That is Will on the top of that ladder. And he was up there for like six hours, right? Like, yeah. And my brother Larry as well in here. And so we did these camera security companies. And part of that was, it was all just availability, right? I didn't know anything about security. I mean, I knew some things. I'd install some systems, but it, it wasn't a thought. It was all availability. I was completely focused around availability. And as such, we'd get a camera system installed, and then we would you know, punch holes through firewalls so that way we could you know, get an active X on Internet Explorer 6 to run. It's not a joke. That was a real thing. <laughs> we, we used to do that, right? And so we, would, we, we didn't care about security. We're just making things work. And that turned into all sorts of other weird IT things. When you help a customer with one thing and you can log into their firewall, suddenly it's like, oh, could you do B, C, D, E, F, G? And it turned into all sorts of IT things. Racks and installing things and whatever was needed, we just started like building that out, helping people with all their general IT. Part of that, I had a customer who said, hey, uh, he called me James, so James my first name. Hey, James, uh, can we do this PCI compliance that... Uh, the credit card brands are asking me to do. And I was like, I don't, I don't know anything about any of that, right? And he's like, well, can you look into it? Sure. So I go, I go home and Google's the PC. I, I, I'm going to call it Duck It now. We're ducking it. Duck, duck, go. I went home and I ducked it. And uh, I, I, I researched and saw what came up PCI. And my immediate reaction was like, no, 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 no. <laughs> I don't do that, PCI, this thing looks like a dumpster fire, it is a mess, I don't want to touch it, I don't want to do it, and, <laughs> and he said, okay, fine, sure. Uh, like a month later, he came back and he's like, hey, uh, I really like your help with this PCI compliance. And I was like, didn't you find somebody else? I told you I'm not qualified, I don't understand it, I don't know anything about PCI, and it looks like a mess. And he's like, I'd, I'd really want you to do it. Um, come to find out, I had a really cheap rate at the time. I just didn't know. It was $35 an hour, right? Like, I, I didn't know. I didn't know. Um, so I said, all right, I'll agree to it. If you pay me to research PCI, understand it, and if I don't deliver it properly, I still get paid for the hours on the research. Fine. Okay. So I spent a bunch of time uh, did doing PCI. We did a full, I think it was like SAC D, and we get through it, and they bring an external auditor. And the external auditor comes in, and they look at everything, and they're like, all but this one thing, you missed this one thing. Part of that was policy creation and other things, but we did this one thing, and after that one thing, they cleared and passed their PCI compliance, and my learning curve of security went from punching holes in firewalls for IE6, for ActiveX to run, make sure you click allow, you gotta click allow, all the things. My learning curve of security started shooting up, and I started to catch this little bit of bug of InfoSec. This little part of like, hey, you know, there's a whole other side besides just availability. <laughs> we, we should probably secure some things, right? And that led to me going to the company I worked at and saying like, hey, we, we, we take a lot of credit cards. We should be doing a lot of these things. At the time, I don't know if it was around the time it came out or maybe it was before and I just got access to it, there's this thing called Lucid Chart that I thought was like the most amazing thing ever. And so, um, a little bit of this story will lead to that. What happened was I went to my boss, and I was like, hey, all these PCI compliance things. And uh, I, was, I had him on the phone call, and he was like, I don't understand what you're saying. I don't understand any of it. This is much like my reaction when I first looked up PCI. Like, no, this is a mess. And he's like, maybe you need to type it up for me. So I still have it. I couldn't, it was all redacted when I tried to get a screenshot of it. But an entire email talking about all the things in PCI that needed to get accomplished. And I ship it over to him. I'm really proud of this work. And he's like, I don't understand any of this, right? Like, this is still a mess. And so I had the idea. Let's take Lucid Chart. I'm going to make a flow chart. This is the actual flow chart I made in 2011. The org name is blocked out. I'm sure I could do a better one today. Um, but funny enough, I had, I had this whole side of like, is the company willing to change if no status quo? And then a whole bunch of things over here that were more IT related, including like maybe legitimate Windows you know, keys and stuff. And then on the left-hand side was like PCI compliance. And this is required. And if you don't, you're going to pay fines. And then I looked at the stuff we were doing and the stuff we weren't. And I created like this really short list of like, all right, well, maybe we need not default credentials. And maybe we actually need a policy that says we're doing PCI, right? Maybe we actually need to get some Cisco training because I don't know what I'm doing on that, right? Um, 
different unique IDs. Maybe we shouldn't all log in with the same credentials. So I went through all of it and tried to find the differences and listed it out. And at the end of the day, I was like, you know, I'm just gonna list all the references of PCI at the bottom just so that way I'm covered, right? So this is my actual, this is like a GIF of me make, of bumping through it. But this is like legitimately, and you'll even see like the date stamp in the far right. This is 2011, like a decade ago. That's insanity to me to think about. And so I delivered this and it got forwarded up because people actually understood big red things that said required and large fines. <laughs> right? So I delivered it and it went all the way up to the executives and then I got in a lot of trouble. I got in a lot of trouble. At the time, I was like a director of operations running movie theaters, multiple locations, and I, I did IT. I stood up some point of sale systems, like, and then obviously camera systems, right? But I got in a lot of trouble. Jump, there's people who are responsible for IT, and it wasn't me. And they were not happy with this, right? And instead of being like, yeah, we should improve some of these things, and how do we work towards this, they just got told, like, no, we're doing that. And you're a young kid from Utah and stay in your lane, essentially. That's maybe my interpretation of it. Those words weren't exact, but multiple calls where I was wrong and they were right, even though I was like, hey, I'm overseeing a lot of these buildings and I guarantee we're not doing that. Anyway, regardless, it got to a point where I was like, just, just leave me alone. I'm going to keep running the theaters. You guys do whatever. Um, I'm going to do that on the side consulting. I think the laptop, this is why I'm talking too much. A single slide. All right. So then I get a call. It's like a Friday. I remember I was like in the theater tearing tickets. And I get a call, and they're like, do you know what's going on with these buildings? And I'm like, no. I have no, I have no idea, right? That's not my building. And they're like, uh, they're saying we need a PFI. And my immediate response was, oh, you got breached. And then attacks. How did you know that? How did you know we got breached? I'm like, well, you said PFI. That's a PCI forensic investigator. You want know, to talk about that learning curve of PCA? I got nerdy. Like, I printed those things out. I was reading them. I was living, breathing PCI. I was thinking, maybe I can make a lot of money charging $35 an hour to do PCI, right? <laughs> I was reading it, so I knew exactly what PFI meant, and they're like, okay, well, uh, the brands, MasterCard, telling us we gotta get that. We don't know what to do, and the links they sent us were the same links that were in the bottom of your flowchart. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. PCI. So I immediately pivoted, the people covering my stuff, and I uh, had to go hire an IR team, forensic team that was you know, certified. We get on site, and I'm meeting with these guys and you know, confirming the breach. Yep, total, total breach, uh, just so you know, because I'm nerdy and I like that stuff. Came in through PC Anywhere. You remember that? Came in through PC Anywhere, some default creds, server, effect terminals. And uh, the credit card swipes, I and mean, they're finally moving off. We'll chat about that in a minute. Um, they're just key loggers, right? It's a USB key logger. Literally, if you open up Notepad and swipe your credit card, it just prints out your credit card information. So they were just, every time you swiped a card, it was just saving it to a text file called, it was like something stupid, like uh, 1.txt or something. And then it was sending those all to the server, and the server's batching them to an FTP server like every hour. Like, hey, we want to make sure we get this. Every hour, send out credit cards. So confirm breach. And I get there, and I'm chatting with the guy, and I, you know, I talk a lot, right? So I was like earful of this guy. I'm like in his ear, what's happening? What's this thing doing? And by the end of it, I hear him on the phone with his boss, and he was like, like dude, these guys have it. They, they, they have, he has the freaking PCI like printed out, and he's referencing things about it that I don't even know, right? And so I was like, okay, like my learning curve, my little bit of bug for IR and forensics all shot up. I then had to turn around and secure that environment. And so I don't know if anybody's ever got YouTube certified. That's where half your screen on your laptop in the back room is YouTube and the other half's your Cisco terminal. And <laughs> you're trying things and then Nmap to validate it. Nope, that didn't work. <laughs> trying things. And then you, you learn the hard lesson of what a running config and a save config is. <laughs> After you get it all working and you reboot it. For those who don't know, and you, you reboot your Cisco device, plug it or otherwise, and you lose everything you did if you don't save it. Um, learn that lesson. So yeah, learning curve shot up, everything goes up, and it turns into securing the site, becoming a director of IT, moving out of operations, going full into IT, and start doing presentations that are required by PCI, like why does security matter internally? It turns in even bigger, I start doing it for the industry. 
I start presenting for movie theater other I exhibitors and uh, you know people who make the content, I'm going to industry events, and I'm presenting on security. And not my words, because I'm a smart enough security professional to never say these words, but other people's words, you have the most secure theater chain in North America. And that was primarily because we were not proactive. We got breached, <laughs> right? And so then spend was there, time was there, people were on board because we already dealt with this pain. And at the time, 2011 breach, everybody cared. Like, like now, I think if that happened, I don't think anybody would be like, whatever, like another breach. But we had like 17 police precincts and government agencies, and it was in, we had to keep hard drives for seven years of every terminal. Like that stuff is now just like, whatever, new can pave it, let's go, everybody's getting wrecked, right? So it's completely changed. But so I start doing these presentations on why security matters in the industry and uh, at, at big events. And that led to that you know, initial slide deck. Also, um, I, I decided after like five locations, because there's like 17 or something, I'm like, PCI sucks, right? Like, I know I like it and I have a big learning curve, but it's a lot of freaking work. Like a SAC D at the time was like 265 questions or something insane. And I found these loopholes called end-to-end -end encryption. And I was like, wait, what is this thing? And it's like 10 questions. You have to answer these 10 questions every year. And I'm like, yeah, I'm doing that. So we moved, we moved everything to these Verifone units in 2011. Like, you know, just now everybody's like, put in the chip, beep, beep, beep. We did that long ago because I was like, I'm tired of this. And I actually proved out an ROI going to that instead of doing PCI SACD. So anyway, we ended, that's how we ended up most secure because even if we're completely breached, there's no credit cards. They're all encrypted and Verifone has the other end of that key, right? Anyway, so I'm trudging through PCI for lots of years, like three or so, and I was like, I wonder if there's other people doing these things. It just literally had never dawned on me. So much work in front of me, just plowing through it. I'm like, are other people doing security in PCI? I would like to talk to some of them. So I Google it, duck, duck it, dang it. I duck it, and uh, the hit comes back with uh, DEF CON, right? And I'm like, oh, that sounds cool. And it already just passed. I'm like, oh. And then I found SaintCon. I'm like, oh, SaintCon, it's coming up in like two weeks, in October, in Weber. And I'm like, all right. I'm going to try to go to this. So I put this proposal to my boss. I'd like to go to St. Con, get some training, get better at PCI things. And he's like, yeah, I don't really see the value of that. So back and forth, back and forth. I think they, they did agree to like, okay, we'll pay half your time. You pay the other half. But all meals, travel, all's on you. Your car's on you. Okay. So I got like two days paid to go to St. Con, I think. I think that's right, 2014. So I show up and yeah, I, I missed the very beginning. So I didn't know who Troy was. I missed this entry keynote because I got, late, got there late because I was doing a job. And uh, so I didn't know who Troy was, and yeah, I was ranting about the AV. That wasn't the smartest move, but um, <laughs> got stuck doing AV. It, it's been fun. It's actually been great doing that. But what I did, who I did meet in the lobby when I first showed up was Metacortex and uh, uh, Danny. And he was there with 801 Labs, and he's talking about all the things that 801 Labs is doing. And I didn't, I didn't understand the vision. Like, he explained it, and I'm like, I don't, I don't know if that's for me, right? And so I left, and he was like, I made some counterpoints, and he was like, yeah, that sounds good. So then I went uh, into uh, presentations, and when I tell you when I went to my first St. Con, it was like, I just, like, found family. It was kind of weird. And I was, like, super nerding out, like, super tech guys up there doing a presentation on, like, IR evidence, and I'm taking, like, pictures of his slides. Nerdy, miles on fishing. And you know, just watching all the things that they're doing, and I'm like documenting them. I mean, Aaron Toppins on like the math of passwords, and I moved to a password card then, and I still use it. Like insane, like how much I was just trying to soak in. I still have like all these Google Notes uh, from that first conference and pictures from it. And then I went to Metacortex's talk, and it went from like this this bug of security of PCI of things that I thought interesting to he pulled out a computer turned up a, a can of compressed air, froze the RAM, pulled it out and like dumped all the, the memory out of clear text off a computer it wasn't even running. And I was just like, what in the freak? <laughs> right, like I, I legitimately had never seen anything any, as so amazing. And so I came out of there and I was like, wherever this guy is, I need to go. So I went to anyone Labs, whatever that pitch was before, but show me that, I'm going. And it went from like, oh, there's not just PCI, but there's like attacks and all this other weirdness. And I'll, so freak. So I went, I went to 801 Labs. I met Troy there. Um, I didn't remember him too much from the Saint Con uh, as much, but I met him there. He's teaching me how to paint a wall or something. Uh, he has a really fancy way to paint a wall. If you need how to paint a wall, Troy knows how to paint a wall. 
Um, I did show him how to like make cables and he didn't believe it. This is just a side. I just remembered it. Um, I was doing some cat six cables cause remember I had a company that we're doing all this stupid cabling for two piece. And I was like banging them out super fast. And he's like, no way you can do it as good or fast as me. And I like wrecked him. And then he's like, okay, that's better. Uh, anyway, that's where you get your street creds, make some weird cat six cables. But at 801 labs, I'm, I met Nemus there and I'm going to his reverse engineering malware classes. And after sitting through six of those, uh, I hate assembly. I will never do reverse engineering malware. I'm glad people do. Um, I, I learned that I don't like it. Um, I love Nemus, he's the best, but I hate assembly. So reverse engineering malware's out. I met Neil there, a uh, grifter, and uh, they were like, hey, we're doing all these Fortinet APs. We're flashing them all for Black Hat. And so I just sat there and helped them flash Fortinet APs for like hours. And they're like, you wanna, you wanna go to Black Hat? And I'm like, well, yeah, that sounds cool, but I'm not paying no like thousands of dollars to go to Black Hat. And they're like, no, you can come on the NOC team and go for free. And I'm like, yeah, let's go. So that's how I joined Black Hat, got in the Black Hat NOC, just meeting them there. And uh, lots of people started running DC801 and getting presenters, and I met a lot of people doing that. So that's how I pivoted there. And then it moved into becoming a defender. So I'm like, okay, I'm gonna get out of this director of IT role and I'm gonna become a security defender. This is a game I used to love to play, anyway, defender. So playing defender in security, um, handed lots of tools and things that I'd used some parts of, some not others, but just focus. Instead of being like a par small part of what you're doing, it's your whole job, right? You are a defender, go defend. And part of that, I got handed a Qualys box. Okay, you got, you got vulnerability management. Cool, that doesn't seem so hard. <laughs> yeah, the whole the entire story is about Qualys and vulnerability management. It's a mess. <laughs> like, I, I go in there and look at it, and you have essentially two buckets. The bucket of the systems that are auto-patching, they're auto-patching, and the other bucket. And that other bucket is the report that it got generated last week is the same report that got generated a year before, except new vulnerabilities are on it, right? And so I'm trying some things there. I'm you know, sending out the auto emails, asking people to do stuff, and it just wasn't happening, right? The same report, the same thing. And I became really like frustrated about it. And there was other things, but like I got super like in a weird funk and depressed. Like maybe I made the wrong call. Maybe I shouldn't be in full-time security. Maybe I go back and tear tickets at a movie theater. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm not making any progress. I'm just bashing my head on this wall and nothing's happening. Uh, we did some pen testing, kind of felt like a lot like that when you can't get a foothold, you're just slamming your head against the wall the entire time. And after like a few months, I was, you know, debating just calling that quits. And I just decided, you know what, I'm just going to hyper focus on vulnerability management. That's it. It's the hardest thing, the part that I hate the most. I'm going to just focus on that. I'm going to see what I can do. I'm just going to change my mindset about it. I get to do this instead of I have to do this. And I'm going to plow through on vulnerability management. So I did, I created, I call it the FBI top 10 hit list, where I just said, here's the top 10 vulnerabilities in the entire org. And that department owns one, and that department owns one, and that department owns one, so I'm gonna send a personal email instead of the Qualys report. I'm gonna copy it out, I'm gonna paste it, why it matters, what somebody can do with that information. Uh, let me come and talk to you about it afterwards, blah, 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 send it over. Some of that gained traction, some it didn't. Some I just throw out calendar invites conference room, you, <laughs> and I just show up. Sometimes they showed up, sometimes they didn't. But interestingly, after a while, it started really gaining traction. People are showing up, they're listening to what I say, they're like, yeah, that sounds bad, or we're coming up with mitigations if you can't. And after a period of time, months, this wasn't like the next day, months, interestingly enough, we're all rowing in the same direction, objectively, by reports, we have improved security posture. The thing that I thought was the hardest, most frustrating, became very rewarding. Building rapport with all these departments that could care less, they were just like me, just availability, punching holes in firewalls. I don't care, I just need this to work, right? My job's to make stuff work. So start talking to them, building those rapports, and improving security. And it was very gratifying when it actually happened. That led into, I also find this weird FTP traffic. And then that leads into, okay, what is that? And it's this camera system. And there's just this camera that's legitimately doing the shadiest things ever. Like full FTP in, SSH in, SSH out, FTP out. And it's just like this most amazing proxy for somebody that they've just been using for, we don't know, as far as back as the logs went. And so that kind of caught me a little bit of bug of like going and looking and hunting. 
like, oh, we can just look through this data and find interesting stuff. And so I pivoted to another job where uh, there was stuff in between, but I'm cutting to the chase for you on this. We pivoted to a job where I went and did a lot of threat hunting. And part of that, I was a sales engineer team who worked on uh, threat hunting. And I got to talk with giant, giant orgs and hunt through giant orgs data. And that was a lot of fun. And we do stories on that. Me and Grifter have a ton of stuff on those. And you could easily tell the org who was just trying to do a compliance checkbox for the sake of it or for, H, or sorry, for insurance or for compliance or some other reason or the ones who actually cared. Legitimately, there was orgs where, yeah, you put in the IDS, you racked it, you powered it on. Okay, how's it working? How do you use it? Oh, we don't use it. Traffic actually doesn't pass to the IDS. So wait, you bought a really expensive IDS and you're not passing any traffic into it? Yeah, that's correct. Why would you do that? Oh, uh, because our compliance says we have to have an IDS. <laughs> but it doesn't say it has to be used or even monitoring traffic. This is, this is stuff you find and see. If you're just trying to check a box, you can absolutely check a security box and miss the whole point. And I've seen it. You can also do it for the right reasons. And when you talk to an org that was doing it for the right reasons, it was super refreshing. Here's what we do, and we're trying to improve this posture, and here's our prioritization list, and here's what we're working on. It gives me like goosebumps. I'm like, oh, like, I just love talking to you because you care about security for the right reasons. When you're doing it just to like, I don't really want to deal with this, I'm just required to, um, you might as well just not do it, right? But part of that, we're still dealing with the same things. These big orgs with big security teams, we're still talking about CIS 20 or 18 now. I guess we're calling it 18 now. CIS 18 framework, or whatever framework you choose. Not discriminatory. Um, and the number one is inventory your devices. Well, big orgs with big teams still don't have this down. The ones who care and are really doing it for the right reasons have it down where it matters. I have my critical servers. I know what they are, and if anything ever gets added there, I get a notification or alert on it. Maybe they don't care about the kiosk in the lobby. Maybe they don't care about guest Wi-Fi. CEO's laptop, yep, CFO's, they care about the critical assets. But we're still talking about these same things a decade later. Same slide deck, inventory of devices. We're spending time looking at that. Local admin. I remember going on a circuit across Utah talking about how to remove local admin from your environment. Still a thing. We're still talking about this because it's hard. Security is hard. It's the part that makes it exciting and fun. It's also the part that gets you a little bit depressed, like, ugh, uh, how did that ransomware spread? Oh, yeah, they all had local admin. Cool. Yep, that makes sense. Um, why does somebody in finance need local admin? I don't know. It's like the sister of the owner, and they just needed to have it, right? But we're still talking about these same things. One more thing I wanted to note on a story-wise. I was sitting here running AV. And we had a keynote, lost, I don't know if it was 2017, I think that's right. Anyway, I was just sitting, sitting down here, I think I was actually on the floor, like by the camera, and uh, he mentioned something like, just a single slide deck, he was like, a single, a single slide. Hey, uh, sometimes when I'm doing pen tests, I check for a Cisco smart vulnerability. And I remember pulling out my Google uh, Keep, my notes, and I wrote, Cisco smart vulnerability, question mark. OK. And then I forgot all about it for like months. Months later, I was looking through my notes. Cisco smart vulnerability. What is that? Start researching it. Oh, Cisco says it's not a vulnerability. It's a feature. Cool. All right, so not a vulnerability. Um, are we looking at the same thing? Yep, we are. That's it. All right, well, I'm going to try it. Grab a script. I run it against a Cisco backend switches, and I get a full config. I'm like, dang. Uh, maybe I'm in a privileged network, though. So I spin up a Vulture VPS, one of the shady VPSs, like $2.50 or something. Spin up a Vulture VPS, and I do it again, and I dump the config again from a privileged network, completely external in LA, the Vulture one. And then I was like, holy crap, that's not good. So I'm like, can we check the log and see if anybody's done this before? I come back, yep. Besides my IP, yep. Somebody has dumped this config before. And that turned into a full scale, we got to burn keys, we got to burn creds, there's automated tools that are rolling these keys and creds. And part of that, people were like, this is awesome and we're glad we found this. But then there's also like, freaking security has given us so much work to do. Right? You've just saddled us with this 
pile of work to do when we already have our job and everything to do. And now we gotta go do all these switches and all these things, let alone some of those switches when you update them remotely in the middle of Utah fall over. And that caused all sorts of other grief. And right, I wasn't intending to cause any grief, right? That's not the intent. But the view of that, some people were very appreciative. This is great. We're glad we found this. We're glad somebody's not in there. We should definitely roll this. And others were like, no, we'd rather not know. So what does this all lead you? I told you a lot of stories. Let's see if we can stitch them together, right? Sometimes what do we need in security? Sometimes we just need buy-in and spend time, materials, tooling, whatever that might be to move things forward. Sometimes we need to listen. Maybe there's just a keynote. Maybe not me, somebody maybe more wise, like Lost, who's up here with just a little nugget of something that you're like, maybe you're going to SaintCon your first time or your fifth time or whatever, and somebody just mentions something, and you just write it down like, what was that thing? I'm going to go research it and pay a little more attention to it. Sometimes it's go look, go hunt, right? You can assume you're already compromised, and how would somebody do that, and how would you do that, and go look for it. Do you even have visibility to see if that did happen, right? Do you even have a log that would show you if somebody did that? In that scenario where you know, the uh, Cisco, Cisco did later uh, categorize that as a vulnerability, they did change it after that. Um, but if in that scenario, do you even have a log that said somebody did log in and try that before? Or you just don't know? So go look, right? Sometimes it's just James Pope with mental struggles of like, I'm in this job, nothing changed at that job. The org didn't change, the supervisor didn't change, money didn't change, nothing changed except my mindset. Sometimes it's just your mind. Sometimes you're just told to stay in your lane, right? Get out of my face, security. You're the no guys. Your job's just coming here and tell me what not to do. I just want to do my job, right? I'm punching holes through firewalls. I'm doing IE6 and ActiveX. We're doing this. And so what changed in some of these scenarios? One, it took a breach. Hopefully that's not needed to get hearts and minds moving in the right direction but it is a reality. And hopefully when an org gets breached, they don't end up with this baseline of comfortable again that they forget that pain and have to go through it again. Hopefully it doesn't take a breach. Sometimes it's just your mindset. I'm just gonna call this a James Pope one. This is the cycle I go through. It, this is what tied this whole talk together from when I first thought about doing it. it was like, I got depressed and oh, I've lived this before. I've lived these cycles. Sometimes it's just my mindset. I have the opportunity to be an infosec and to look at cool things and do cool things, I get to do that. I can always go back and tear tickets, right? So I get to do this. This is what I choose to do. Sometimes there's real hard work, and sometimes it's mind-numbing, bashing your head on walls. Sometimes it's just hunting. I want to go hunt through my traffic. I'm the biggest advocate of uh, threat hunting. It's a, it's a very sexy name that just means you just look through a lot of data. <laughs> and I taught classes on it, lots of classes on it. And I do recommend everybody goes and threat hunts, even if you're not a threat hunter. Because even if you're brand new to an org, it helps you understand your org, your posture, what you have. Where's my ingress, egress points? Where do things happen? Where's the VRF? Where's, how does the firewalls block this traffic? Go hunt through your traffic. If you don't have time or your boss won't let you do it full time, which most won't, carve an hour on a Friday. I'm going to go hunt one hour on a Friday and just look for it. What's the worst case? You find weird stuff, bad hygiene, and uh, well, hopefully it's not a full-on breach. I have plenty of stories of those for another day but you find interesting things and you come out a better defender. You should know your network better than an attacker who lands on it. That should be their biggest disadvantage. When you first land on a box or when I had pen testing, you land on a box, you spend a lot of time trying to understand who I am, what privileges I have, what other things I can talk to. Security teams, that's our biggest advantage. This is this subnet, this is what it can talk to, here's the privileges they have. What would I do with that? Escalate, etc. Validating. Going and checking for things, right? Going and looking for weird camera systems, um, kind of part of hunting, also kind of part of the lost story of like, here's this thing, it's a new vulnerability. Well, let's go see if that impacts us. The Qualys box doesn't tell us that that exists because it wasn't a vulnerability at the time. But here's red team that are using it all day, every day, right? And then, yes, back to organizations. If you can do nothing else, then Try to do security for the right reasons. Even if it's hard, even if you're like, I, to know all of my assets is daunting, Pope, I can't do it all. I get it, right? All a guest Wi-Fi, you're probably never gonna get there. But start with your critical, what's the most important thing to my organization? Data, IP, whatever that is, 
you should know what resides on those things. Maybe it's a subnet, maybe it's a VLAN, maybe it's however you're logically breaking that out. Know what exists on those. And if that ever changes, you should be notified when that changes. There's scripts to do that. There's tools to do that. There's free things to do that, right? So some of that's hard. Phase one, start with whatever that first security control is. Okay, so this is a, a tactic, TTP, tactic techniques and protocol. This is a tactic that came up with somebody else. I don't know where I got it from, but this is something that I do constantly. I did it this week. I did it even way back when I was getting uh, depressed about the, you know, trying to get vulnerability management improved. What I do is I, even if I'm at night and I can't think, I'm thinking of something, I write it down, and then I put them all on a piece of paper. I'm a little bit old, so sometimes I uh, legal pad it. I legal pad out all the things that I have problems with that I'm trying to improve. And then what I do is I cross off the ones I cannot control. And this will vary by you, your org, varies by me, it varies by the situation I'm dealing with. So maybe in this situation I have time. Maybe in some examples I have no time, right? Here's the things I can control. I have time, I have the tooling, um, but in some situations, maybe you have manager buy-in or you don't. Sometimes your manager's like, I don't understand what this is. Maybe you should make a flow chart, right? And you make a flow chart and lucid chart and send it to them. Most orgs deal with budget and time in some form of those two, sometimes both. Some orgs get lucky enough to get both. Some only get both when you get breached. Um, those two are complicated people, having good people, having good tools. Some tools are free, some tools are paid. There's various forms of that. Communication was literally the one thing that I could control in that scenario of the vulnerability scanner. It was just the way I was communicating. Nothing else changed but my communication, right? Uh, if you're James Pope, it's always mindset. Your training, your people's training around you. Uh, not just that, that knowledge one right there, just showing up to SanCon and somebody being like, there's more people here that do PCI than just you. And you can talk to them and gain other insights of knowledge of things to try or do. There's a way to dump passwords off of memory of the computer that's off. No idea, right? Knowledge. Uh, anyway, documentation is either like somebody's let me down in the past or it's me letting myself down in the future because I don't document. But these are things, cross out the things you can't control and don't focus on those. Focus on the ones you can control. And yeah, if you're me, it's pretty much always this one. This is the one that I always can control and I always get, I get in cycles. I'm not perfect. Cycles of doing this right, cycles of not doing that right. So, all right, what, what does this all mean, Pope? You've told us all this stories and nonsense. What does this mean? Well, first presentation was 2011. Here we are a decade later, 21. What I'm hoping is 2031, we're not talking about the same things again. And that's a daunting task because as I mentioned, those things are hard. Having an inventory of your assets is hard. Removing local admin, developers, security people, hard, complicated, right? But what can we do in this scenario? Well, we can eat our own dog food and we can cross out the things we can't control. <laughs> well, I can't change this whole industry, but I can change myself. I can come to St. Con, I can get knowledge information. I can write something down and go research it later and try it in my org or take whatever training I got and empower my organization to make that better. But by making yourself better, you typically will make your department better. You'll take a weird thing and suddenly that part will grow. In some situations, maybe that doesn't, right? There's, it's not always rosy and perfect. Sometimes you have to change orgs. That does exist as well. But by making yourself better, you typically will improve your department, if nothing more than your own contributions to that department. By making your department or whatever, your security team or whatever that is, you're gonna make your organization better if nothing more than your yield output, you will make your organization better. And by making your organization better, we will make our industry better. It doesn't mean, just like that vulnerability management, it doesn't mean that a month later, all the things are patched and we've made that ob objective improvement. But over a period of nine months, a year, it's measurable. You can actually look at it and say, because we all started doing this thing, maybe we don't have to keep talking about the same thing. I'm not snow, <laughs> if you didn't know. Sorry for the bait and switch. Uh, we love snow. We wish her, to, uh, she recovers quickly and we get her back and we'd love to have her here again next year. Um, but with that said, hopefully you got something out of this. Maybe it inspire you a little bit to just like, I learned something at St. Con, I'm gonna go try it at my org. I'm gonna try something. And if you bash your head on it, 
you might bash your head on it. <laughs> That's security. It's fun, but it's frustrating at times, depending on your role. And we, I don't know how much time, we probably have like a little bit. If there are questions, we can run a mic to you. If not, we can end a little early too. Or yell out and somebody will run you a mic. It's not the most question talk, but maybe there is some. There's someone down over there. I see somebody. I didn't, I didn't hear. I'm sorry. You still have all the Fortinet APs over 801 Labs? You can have them. Uh, I'm not here to vendor bash, but we definitely don't use those anymore. <laughs> Ask me afterwards when I'm, it's not being recorded. <laughs> we, can, we can chat further about that. Any other questions? All right, well, if, if, if anything else, I would say you want to get to network and know people, volunteer at a security conference, <laughs> right? I showed up at First Saint Con in 2014, helped running some pieces in 2015, and uh, thankfully John's doing a much better job of AV than I did and really cool stuff that uh, look forward to seeing when we get LPL up here. Thank you, everybody.